All right, Rachel. There we go. I'm going to sneak over here. So I just want to welcome everybody here tonight. Bienvenidos a todos. Bienvenidos a todos esta tarde. I'm really excited that this is all come together. And I'm really excited to have Diana and Michael here tonight. And estamos muy emocionados que todos han llegado y estamos este, contentos de que Michael y Diana están con nosotros esta tarde. And I'm really expecting big things to happen tonight. Y esperamos grandes cosas que sucedan esta noche. And so. I want to let you know that I want you to have high expectations for what God is going to do in you and to you tonight. Entonces, y entonces, quiero que tengan esperanzas altas de lo que va a suceder en cada uno de ustedes esta tarde. Que Dios va a trabajar dentro de nosotros y a través de nosotros. Amén. So let's stand up. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you here this evening. Come and permeate this place, Lord. Lord, I ask you to dispatch heavenly angels throughout this room. And Lord, we just want to welcome you here tonight. We want to welcome you to inhabit the praises of we, your people.
you, Jesus. Oh, we, we come to give you praise. One more time, let's sing that all together. To give glory of you, Jesus. Who we have come to give you praise. Oh, you holy Jesus. And you wonderful Jesus. And there's only one who's worthy. Oh, there's only one who's worthy. There's no one coming after you, Jesus. Jesus, and you're doing marvelous things, Jesus. You're doing wonderful things, Jesus. We are here for you, God. Come and do what you do. Sing it out. We are here. Do what you do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do what you do. Cause we need a move. Cause we need a move. Well, how we want you, Jesus. Cause we need your move. As we need a moon, let's see mountains. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe, and yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Oh, yes, and bodies are still being Giants are still being slain. Sing it out now. God, we believe it. And yes, we will see it. Wonders are still what you do. Sing bodies. Bodies are still being
your voice. Oh, we want, we want to be just like you. Your glory is enough. Mind us with your love. Father, we want, we want to be just like you. Lift your voice. Make us one. Come and 
Ah, I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited about what God is doing in the earth. I'm excited about what God is doing right here in Boulder County. I'm excited about what God is doing in each and every one of you. Hmm. Are they working okay? Can they hear? No? They can't hear, Bruno. Ah, Maribel's going to help them. Yeah, my is helping them. There we go. We good? All right. So I just want to welcome everybody once again. So I got a hard one for Bruno, and I've said it before. <laughs> but... 
If you don't expect anything from God tonight, he won't let you down. I'm just saying is, if you don't expect God to do something, he's not going to do something because we have free will. But I know for a fact that God wants to do something tonight. He wants to do something to shift the atmosphere. He wants to do something to move people. He wants to do something in each and every one of you that are here, each and every one that is watching on the live stream, each and every one watching in Thailand. God wants to do something great. And all he's looking for is willing people. He's just looking for people that will say, truly, God, here I am, use me. And we have to be open to let God use us however he wants to use us. It's such an exciting time we live in today. Do you know God is, God is moving in a revival way and it's not like any revival in history. And I truly believe that we're moving in one of the greatest revivals that the earth has ever seen. I believe we're going to see more people come to know Jesus than we ever have before. And I want to tell you that in order for that to happen, each and every one of us need to step up and be the Christians we're called to be. It's not about leaders of a church. It's about all of us stepping up and doing what God has called us to do no matter what it is. Amen? All right. Did everybody enjoy the team? All right. So you just turn the switch on the top, sir. Yeah, you guys can come up. So back in October, we were in, it was October, correct? Yeah. Bali. Yeah. yeah. We were in Bali, Indonesia. And uh, part of Catch the Fire, there was a pastor's conference there. And Michael and Diane were there. And we're all so busy. And every time we see him, we say, hey, we have to get together. <laughs> And so they set a time to come, and we were so excited, and then all these things happen, and things get going busy, and he called me, he sent me a message and said, hey, we're still on, and the great thing is, he, he pastors, he coaches pastors, but also they pastored a church in San Francisco during the Jesus Movement. And they saw lots of people saved. And so I know that this is a time for them to share some testimonies. You know, the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Amen. And what Jesus did then, when a testimony is shared, we can pull that down and we can see that happen today in our lives. And I really believe that this is the beginning of something great. Amen? Amen? All right. Come on, come on, family. I'm so glad to be here with you, you know. I feel like it's a little bit of heaven um, with our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters here tonight, and I just heard him say so maybe some people from Thailand because it says every kindred tribe and nation are going to come together, and he's going to bring us into one family, you know. So, uh, yeah. Oh, well, I've been to Thailand more than any other country outside the U.S., and it holds a big part of my heart, also Latin America. Um, yeah, well, my name's Diane, and Michael and I are married for 43 years, coming up soon, and we have seven children, which is my biggest claim to fame. And, uh, yeah, you know, we were told that we, we could come and talk about the moves of God that we've been through and what God's doing on the earth right now. And 
because the spirit of the Lord is willing. You know, he says, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the things of the kingdom. He never wants to hold back. Um, I got this scripture for all of us tonight. It says, behold, you know, you might remember that old-fashioned picture of Jesus knocking on the door. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He that opens to me, um, I'll come in and have sup with him. It's like he wants to meet us where we are tonight. He just wants to come in, fellowship with us, heal us deliver us, encourage us, heal us. And so, um, yeah, Michael and I have been privileged, you know, to be a part of historical moves of God. And by moves of God, I mean that it's not just a, a revival or a salvation of one, but of many. The Spirit of the Lord will sweep into a culture or a people or a society and simultaneously, in different churches, different denominations, different age groups, people will begin to be awakened. Amen. And um, all of us need, know that there's something lacking in this world, you know? It's not fulfilling the ache of our heart. We can be lonely and isolated. And God gave us that cry for him, you know? that It says that, uh, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're his son. So those of us that know him, those of us that are yet to know him, have a cry. And God begins to open the door for people. I came to the Lord um, when I was a teenager. Um, my family, Michael's family also, we didn't come from Christian homes. We didn't know anything really of the Bible or Jesus. Um, during that era, um, it was, they call it sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was the hippie movement. It was the anti-war movement. Society was in um, a lot of angst. Um, the generation before didn't show a lot of love. Uh, in necessarily to their kids. They were working, they were working, they were trying to make a better life, and the kids were saying, there's got to be more, and revolting from um, what the parents had, and all that. So that's what I was born into, and um, yeah, I, I got a friend, a girlfriend, that was 20 years old, and I was only 14 years old, and which, you know, is, is a little bit of a recipe for disaster, maybe, but I had gone to this school, um, and they had tested me, and they, they told my parents, oh, this girl's so smart, she's a genius, let's put her in a special school, and my parents listened to that, and they said, they would introduce me and said, oh, my, my daughter's 13 going on 30, and so they treated me like I was 30, which wasn't good for me, you know? Um, even though I was kind of mature, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't mature. And so I got a friend, and we just became close. And we went to see the movie The Exorcist, which was playing. And um, so outside the door of the theater, this guy's pack passing out tracts, which are like little papers about Jesus. And it was from a, a ministry called Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. And there's just a movie come out about that. If you haven't seen that, what's it called? It's called Jesus Revolution. Woo! Wow, we're a devil. <laughs> yeah, and um, that's the time that I was living in. I'd, I'd encourage you to go see that movie if you haven't seen it. But um, he, the guy said, the devil's real and God's real. And you're welcome to come to our church. He passed us a track. And we literally, I say, had the, we had the hell scared out of us, scared the hell out of us. And we just thought, let's go to this place. Neither one of us had ever really been to church. And we came to Jesus. It was the beginning of the Jesus Revolution. It was the first um, kind of rock and roll music that had ever been produced in mass. It was called Maranatha Music. And there were hundreds and ultimately thousands of people our age sitting around us. I, um, I went, to, went to church barefoot, which, you know, you're in beach culture and hippie culture. And um, there are a lot of people like me, thank God. But, um, you know, the, the 
the vibe at that time was people were ripe for the gospel. When, when they told me Jesus is alive, he's real, um, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. You know, those are, those are really, especially like in our culture today, those are really foreign concepts. It was a foreign concept to me, but I had incredible faith and that there was incredible openness supernaturally that I would receive the Lord. And um, there were discipleship houses and uh, we got discipled a little bit in there. Uh, I didn't end up getting discipled a lot until a couple years later, but um, I got baptized in uh, Pirate's Cove that you see in that movie, where there's maybe eight pastors out there and there's hundreds of people on the cliffs just waiting to get baptized. And, um, you know, we're, we're starting to see little, little earmarks of God awakening the next generation. Um, you may have heard of this little college in in kentucky just recently having an outpouring do yeah. many of you have you heard about yeah. this yeah so um yeah they were just they were worshiping and praying very simply and they just felt led to keep going and it caught fire over the next couple days hundreds then thousands then nations started coming and it spread to other colleges and you know, a lot of old, old school um, believers started analyzing it. Is this really God? Maybe this is revival. What are the real earmarks of revival? I don't know if we can call this revival. <laughs> you know, it's just like all this stuffiness. And a prophetic friend of mine said to our group, he said, we, don't, we shouldn't be questioning this. We should be saying, may it be so. May yes, it God. be the first fruits of the sweeping of the Spirit of the Lord. And we can believe for that, you guys. Um, Michael and I met early on uh, when we were in our young 20s, and we, we planted a church, and we were a part of um, a movement that moved around the country and the world called uh, The Vineyard. And we started to, to learn about signs and wonders. You know, we were part of a Bible-believing church. We prayed for people. We saw a move of the Holy Spirit. But we never saw signs and wonders. We never saw really the things in the Bible. We didn't see people get instantly healed. We didn't see people get healed of oppressive spirits. We didn't, we didn't see these things. We went to this conference... And we saw these things. And I said, Michael, this is crazy. We saw people fall down under the power of the Spirit and get up and be emotionally transformed. Or, or they would be physically transformed. Or there would be demonic stuff, lies that they would bl had believed in the past that would be broken off of them. And I said, Michael, if this is real, when we go home, we're, we're going to have to see the same thing because this is this almost feels too good to be true. It was in 2,000 people, and it was all happening. Well, we went home, and it was like it was on our clothes, you guys. The first little, we went to this little home group in San Francisco, and um, we started telling the story, and this woman that had been impressed for years, we were just telling the story, and she fell to the floor and began to cry out, and what we had just learned, we, we were able to set her free. And the Lord began to do that, not just in our midst, day by day, words of knowledge, wisdom, healing, salvations, restoration, the hunger of the people coming together. But it went nationally and internationally, and, and, um, and we were a part of the same thing during the Toronto move. But you know, when you've had the best of the best, which is what I'm talking about, when there's a lull or when it seems to go away, you feel so sad. Because once you've experienced Jesus in his full glory and you don't see that on a regular basis, your heart mourns. And there's a teacher, you may have heard of him, his name is Bill Johnson. When I started hearing him talk about the fact that revival, God, God's plan is that revival would come and that revival would remain. 
that we wouldn't live in barren wastelands where we're just, uh, where we feel like we're paupers in the kingdom. We don't have much to give people. We're feeling hopeless. We're feeling sad. We're, we're feeling besought. But, but that the Lord would come with sustained revival. And I believe that we are on the verge historically of another move of God. Biblically, it lines up, you guys. Scripturally, if you look at the prophetic, um, the prophetic history of the Bible, it just it just points to the t- the fact that for such a time as this, Amen. and God's inviting each one of us into it, you know. And you know the the young people, like these people sitting in the front row, like they they are. They're our target group, you guys. You They're guys the ones it. that are going to, that's you guys. You guys are so important. You little, you little, little niños, right? Yeah. Niñas. <laughs> Ni- They're just like, um, God, I'm, I just want to say that we need to not be um, disillusioned to walk in disappointment with what we haven't seen in the past or regrets that we've seen. And let our hearts be stirred up towards hope and hopefulness and faith that God can do it. God can do it aside from us. And I'll end with this story. We live in California, and there's been a terrible drought for years where they're saying, you you know, don't flush your toilets. Um, You can only water, you know, like once a week or not water at all. The lakes that were beautiful... You can see the bottom of the lake, and there's like a little river in the in the bottom of the lake. It's uh, it's gone down that much. Well, when we just moved recently, and I just was praying in the car one day, I said, Lord, I really ask that you would heal this land, that you would heal our land. But then I had this kind of reticence where I felt like, you know, the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land and visit them. And I felt like, but our land, California, so much in our, in our country is against the ways of the Lord. And I, I felt a doubt, like how, how can this happen that God would heal our land? And I was telling this to the Lord, and he said, Diane, you have to remember, I love to work through the remnant. You know, time and time again in the scripture, a remnant is just a small piece of a big piece of cloth. It can be a small group. You know, with Abraham, with Job, oftentimes the Lord said, if there's one, I'll, Mm -hmm. I'll hold back. That's right. And so, you guys, we're a remnant, and we, have bo- we can stand boldly before the throne of God and cry out in faith that God would visit us, our families, that he would break off generational things and set us free so that we can be free indeed to serve the Lord and lead other people into freedom. And that's the hope that we have in what God's doing right now and what he's going to be doing. So, yeah, amen. Well, thank you, Dan. It's amazing. Wow. Hey, um, hi, everybody. That's my wife. We've been married 42 years, like she said. Um, Diane, could you do me a favor? I have a few books and a bag out in the foyer. Could you get one of each and bring... Or are they here? Okay. Bring, yeah, bring uh, three of them in. Well, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you. Um, You know, this church is part of Catch the Fire. Diane and I are also Catch the Fire. And, uh, you know, she mentioned a little bit that we we, um, were part of Toronto in the mid-90s. So here's the story, is that we were part of the Jesus movement in the mid-70s, part of working with with John Wimber in the mid-80s, all the way through to the 2000s. And then we were friends with John and Carol Wimber. I mean, I'm sorry, John and Carol are not. And when we heard about God pouring out his spirit in Toronto in the mid-90s. So the mid-70s, mid-80s, mid-90s, and we dropped everything. We were pretty tired. We'd been through a lot of spiritual warfare. We were planting a church in the heart of San Francisco. We had a meeting hall that sat 1,200 people right in some of the worst districts of the city. 
And we were just like, God, you've got to do something. So we were so hungry that we ran up. I mean, we literally just dropped everything. We flew up to Toronto. We got blasted by God. And, uh, and then we came back. We brought a couple of our, our staff up and did it again. And on the way back, you know, we, uh, we just felt like we were so covered, like, you know, with God's presence and anointing that when we came back to our church, um, my youth leader walks in just to a regular meeting that we're supposed to have every two weeks. And, and literally, when he looks at me, he just falls to the floor and starts laughing. I'm just like, what? He had no preconditioning. He didn't know where he had been. He didn't know what was going on. But he falls to the floor and starts laughing. And he has this incredible encounter with God. And now he pastors a, a church of 2,000 people in Minnesota. The, the point is, is that we just, I went out and talked to my secretary. I said, well, maybe we should invite a few people, see if they want to come together. So that night we had maybe, I don't know, 200 people show up. And that, that night we also went into 18 months of nightly meetings. And so during that time, we were able to have John and Carol come to our, and they're going to be here in, I guess, a few weeks. They, they came to our church, gosh, two or three times, and Randy Clark came to our church, and Wesley and Stacy Campbell, and all these different people that were leaders in that revival. And we just had literally thousands, probably a couple, you know, 10 to 20,000 people visit our building over that period of time, experiencing the presence and power of God. So there's been these waves. There's been waves of the Holy Spirit. But the last big revival that I think the United States has seen is what the Jesus Revolution movie is all about. It's called the, the Jesus People Movement, called by different names. But it was an amazing outpouring. And it wasn't just an outpouring of signs and wonders, but it was an outpouring also of, uh, of salvations. And hundreds of thousands of people came to Christ during that era. And not just in the U.S. It really affected almost every nation that had been affected by the, by the, the Second World War. So it was the post-war generation called the baby boomers. Like Diane said, they had been raised in kind of a, a disillusioned mentality. They had the, you know, the free speech movement and the free love movement. You know, the beatniks became hippies and the hippies kind of you know, went all over the place into the new age and so forth. That was all happening around that time. I was raised in San Francisco during that time. So Diane was in Southern California where the movie takes place. I was raised in our own version of that in, in San Francisco. So when, when I was 10 years old, I was on Haight and Ashbury Street with the, all the hippies that came on the summer of love, that famous time. My parents weren't believers. My dad was a beatnik artist. My mom was kind of tr trying to figure out who she was. They were separated when I was five years old. And anyway, when the, when the hippie thing came, my mom just went fully on into that. And so that was our life. I was raised, you know, around the, the drugs and the New Age philosophy and the, the, you know, we had a commune in the city where we had people come and live with us and, you know, it was just crazy. Draft dodgers and political activists and guru followers and it, I never heard about Jesus growing up. I think I went to church once and it was a bad experience, okay? But I, I just, um, I, th I guess the first time I heard about Jesus was Jesus Christ Superstar, the opera which doesn't tell the gospel at all. And so anyway, so I started hitchhiking around the country and I started meeting believers because this was a favorite way to preach the gospel is you pick up a hippie and they're a captive audience, especially if you're on the freeway going 60, 70 miles an hour. And so anyway, people began to share the gospel with me and I began to fight with them. And, you know, I, I just thought Christians were the most Neanderthal belief system. In other words, I thought they were like the throwbacks, you know, that they were, you know, basically slightly above the apes, you know, in terms of their spiritual mentality, because I was in this enlightened spiritual place as a seeker. But um, one particular day, I got, I got six rides in a row with believers. And I just thought, wait a minute, this is too coincidental, you know. So I got out of, in, in this little town called Boonville, which I'm, I'm, it's literally called Boonville. I got out and I said, surely, great spirit, you don't want me to become a Christian, do you? And the next car that pulled up was this amazing woman named Sabina Ball. And she had come to the Lord out of the New Age and uh, had a commune. And that everybody on the, the commune came to Christ in a very miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And so she was the notorious Jesus freak in our area. And she basically, you know, 
drove me for 25 miles, and then at the end of it, she said, Well, would you like, she was from Germany, would you like to pray with us? And uh, something in my heart said yes. And it was at that point that my life began to change. Now, again, I had no foundation, I had no discipleship, but about two weeks later, I had an open vision of Jesus on the cross. And that, like, really imprinted me, and I just thought, whoa. But I knew that I I was still struggling. I wasn't quite ready yet to give it all for him. So about six months later, I was hitchhiking up to a big uh, gathering called the Rainbow Gathering. A bunch of hippies, about 20,000, gather in the wilderness and uh, you got to remember, there's no cell phones at this moment, there's no internet, so the way you find them is you just go and show up in the area and you look for them. And so I showed up on this Indian reservation in Browning, Montana, the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, and I walked into the general store to ask directions, like, have you seen any hippies around? And uh, I run right into this big Indian guy with long braids and full Indian gear on. He looked, he looked like he could have been from 100 years ago. And uh, he introduces himself. He says, my name is Tiny Man Heavy Runner. Okay, and I just thought, okay, cool, Tiny Man Heavy Runner. And he said, uh, what are you doing here? We hate hippies. And I said, well, I'm trying to find this thing. And he says, okay, I'll help you. So I get in his car, we drive around. We can't find anybody. So he says, well, why don't you, it's getting late, come stay at my house, which happened to be a teepee in the middle of nowhere. It's like, it's like if you can imagine where we are right now up against the Rockies, but about 300 miles north of here. Okay, Glacier Park, and we're, and we're in, you know, so a teepee and a little tiny house, maybe just like literally the corner of this room with 20 people living in it. No running water, they had an outhouse, uh, you had to go down to the, uh, to the river and just get water every day. Uh, they did have electricity, thankfully, and so anyway, but here I am with these Indians, the next morning I meet his grandparents, and they're believers. And they had come to the Lord 40 years earlier through a personal visitation of Jesus. This man had been raised in Catholic mission schools. He was born in 1898. Okay, so you get an idea. At the turn of the last century, now it's 1976, and he's old. You know, he's 78 years old. And he says, you know, he basically welcomes me to stay with them. And um, he begins to tell me the story. I was raised in this mission school. I was beaten if I spoke in my native tongue. I was rebellious, and so the, you know, I didn't have a very good impression of Jesus, okay? But he said that, you know, because of that, he just turned away from the Lord. He ended up drinking a lot. He ended up destroying his stomach lining. He was passing blood continuously. The doctor gave him three weeks to live. He goes into the bar to drink himself to death, and Jesus appears in the bar, and everybody in the bar saw him. So 30 people, like people screamed, they ran out of the bar, they dove under tables, and the Lord speaks to him and says, sober up and follow me. And he speaks to his wife and says, fast for four days and your husband will be healed. So these guys invite me to live with them, and I'm with them for six months into the, you know, Montana winter, living in a tent by now, so the teepee we folded up, but this uh, big army tent, and... um, it was just a life-transforming experience for me. I was baptized there, baptized in the Holy Spirit there. I just had this, and I saw miracles. I, I saw this one woman get set free of demons, and she threw up a black ball. We were talking about that the other day. And then I saw, you know, other people get healed physically, and uh, I actually heard the audible voice of God. Just an amazing season of my life at, for a, a long-haired hippie kid that didn't even have, I was too cool to even have a backpack, you guys. I just had a bag. And I didn't have a sleeping bag, I just had a Gandalf cape. You know, you guys saw the Lord of the Rings? Okay, so Gandalf, you know, and and the the people that visited Lothlorien had these capes that they could wrap up in and nobody would see them, you know? Anyway, that's that's how I traveled. And so, anyway, but Jesus got a hold of my life. And he didn't let me go. And uh, so I was there for six months, and then they said, we've taken you as far as we can. You need to go get trained. And that's when I came back to the Bay Area, I looked for Bible schools, I found this group that was planting a church in San Francisco, and uh, they did on-the-job training, so I didn't have to go away to some schoolroom, I I could be with them doing the work of the ministry, and that's when uh, I met my wife Diane, and uh, she she was a YWAM girl who came up for the outreach, we fell in love, we got married six months after we met, very speedy, and uh, 
And again, we have seven kids, and we raised them planting churches in San Francisco. And that was in and experiencing revival. So anyway, in 2010, the Lord said, you're done. And we uh, moved up to Redding, California. We, wor we worked with a couple of different branches of that ministry there, teaching in the school, working with Jesus Culture. But anyway, actually, I just wanted to <clears throat> let you know about this book. I'll show the other books at a different time. But this book is a, a little bit of what we're going to be talking about this weekend. Okay, this is called Revival Culture, Prepare for the Next Great Awakening. Okay, and this is, this is really like so in my heart. I wrote this book about, I think, eight years ago is when we published it. I, a Banning Leapshire, the head of Jesus Culture, put two chapters in. And a guy named Bill Johnson, I don't know if you guys ever heard of him, he put a chapter in, which was very, very wonderful and generous of him. And, uh, but anyway, the, the whole gist of this is to forecast and to prepare us for what we think we're in the beginning of right now. I don't know if you guys have been tuning in, but Diane mentioned the Asbury outpouring and what was happening there, and then we've been looking at what God is doing with the different campuses and, and all that's going on. Um, most churches that I'm coaching right now are experiencing some upswell of Holy Spirit activity in their midst. I mean, I think that this could be what we've been praying for. And I just believe that it's time. And like Diane said, this friend of ours who's a Catch the Fire prophet, his name's Franklin Spence. He's based in Swiss, Switzerland. You know, he just, like what Diane said, he said, let's pray into this. Let's, let's say, may it be the one. Let's don't just sit on the sidelines and say, okay, God, prove it to me. Okay, let's actually engage the Lord. You know, for years and years, we've lived next to the coast, you know, in San Francisco, and we baptized everybody in San Francisco Bay, you know, in San Francisco Ocean. Um, I've just sat there for hours and watched the surfer surf. You know what a surfer does? A surfer sits out there on their board looking backward to see when there's a swell coming. I believe we're in a swell right now. But you know what? They don't just sit there and wait for the swell to pass. What they do is they get on their face and begin to paddle as fast as they can to catch the wave that will get them the ride that they've been waiting for. It's time for us to paddle, you guys. It's time for us to press in. It's time for us to really prepare the way of the Lord and to really invite His presence at a, at a whole new level. Now again, obviously Jesus loves us. Obviously the cross was 2,000 years ago and what He accomplished on the cross was for all time. I believe in the finished work of Jesus, but I also believe that God's still finishing the work in me. I'm still in process, you guys, and so I need to keep realigning myself with Him, to keep going deeper in my spirit, to keep preparing a way for God to be God in my life. After 47 years of following Jesus, I need more of Jesus. Now, it's all given, it's all there, it's all been granted to us in what Jesus accomplished 2,000 years ago, but there's a process by which we appropriate what has been granted. It's like, okay, you have an ATM full of money, but you only have a $300 limit. Okay, so you draw a certain amount, but then you draw more at a later point. This is really what it means to, when we pray, more Lord. <laughs> We're just saying, God, we know there's more. We know that ultimately, as we read scripture, as we see different outpourings throughout history, and we see what you're capable of, God. We don't want to settle for anything less than the fullness of what you have granted us. So let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 3, and I want to share a little bit of scripture with you. And, um, but these, the, the books that I have will be available, and uh, you know, the, you know, we'll try to keep it as inexpensive as possible. All right, but anyway, Luke chapter 3 and uh, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about prepare the way of the Lord. Now, you guys know that if God's about to move in a powerful way, that we could be on the verge of what could be the greatest harvest of souls in all of human history. You know, uh, John Arnott will talk about it like the last day's revival. Okay, uh, John, uh, who is it? Uh, my brain is a little bit... The altitude, you know, that's what it's all about. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking of Bob Jones. 
And Bob Jones is, was a friend of ours, and, and Bob basically was one of the people that predicted a billion souls coming to Christ. You guys have heard some of that prophecy. Well, it wasn't just Bob. It was also Bill Bright, who was the head of Campus Crusade for Christ, had a vision on a 40-day fast of a massive harvest. And then you go back 100 years to Azusa Street. They said in about 100 years, God's going to pour out his spirit in one of the most massive harvests ever in history. And I believe we're in that moment. And you may say, wow, everything's so chaotic, everything's so weird, everything's so polarized in our culture. How can such a thing happen? Well, think about seven, you know, 50 years ago, 55 years ago. Think about the war in Vietnam and how much turbulence there was. Think about the political uh, you know, polarity that was going on at that time. Think about the race riots that were going on the heels of uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King and uh, Bobby Kennedy. Think about the season we were in. They even had a pandemic back in those days, called the Hong Kong flu. I don't know if you guys remember it, but it cost me dearly. They had a pandemic. In other words, it was a very similar season, and God chose that season to move, to invade, to actually begin to grab a hold of the hearts of literally hundreds of thousands of young people and say, it's time. It's time for you to get right. It's time for you to change. And that uh, season was what we now saw that movie about, all right? I believe that this could be the very season that we're in right now, okay? But the question is, are we ready? Yes. <laughs> are we ready? Well, we're hungry, but are we ready? I mean, just let me throw this at you really quickly. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but the simple math on a billion souls, if we want to uh, talk about a billion babies coming to Christ, okay, a, big, a billion spiritual babies who need to be raised from infancy to adulthood, do you realize that the average church in the U.S. is pastored at a one per hundred ratio, roughly? That's about how many people it takes to generate an income for a pastor. A one per hundred ratio. If we have a billion souls come to Christ, how many pastors do we need to pastor that many people? We need 10 million new leaders. Okay, at a one per hundred ratio. We better get busy. Because right now, Actually, as a result of the pandemic, pastors are dropping out all right and left. You guys didn't know that, but the actual a- average age of a pastor in the last 10 years has grown from, 50, from 44 to 54. In other words, we're not replenishing the ranks with younger pastors. I mean, I, I taught at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry for the last 12 years. Guess what? Everybody that graduates from that school, nobody wants to be a pastor. Everybody wants to be an itinerant ministry, travel from church to church and blow up churches through word of knowledge and healing and so forth. We're not ready for the revival that God wants to bring. Now, thankfully, though, historically, they've never been ready. <laughs> so God always moves even when we're not ready. But if, we're, if we really believe the word of the Lord, let's position ourselves. Let's start saying, wait a minute. All hands on deck, you guys. This is not something, if we got, you know, if we, if we see, how, how many people live in the, the greater Denver area? Two million? Is that close, you guys? Okay, let me just say two million. Okay, well, what's our share of a billion soul harvest, you guys? If a billion is roughly 15% of the world's population, and a billion souls come to Christ, how many does that mean will come to Christ in the, in the greater Denver area? Okay, roughly 300,000 people. And, and pastors are complaining, don't plant that church near me. Come on, we need uh, 10,000 new churches. We don't need just one new church. We need 10,000 new churches if we're going to pastor 300,000 young new believers. 3.6 million. Okay, we'll do the 15% on that. That's 450,000 people coming to Christ in our region if we get our fair share of a billion soul harvest. Come on, you guys. This is something that should cause us to wake up a little bit. Okay, so tonight, though, I want to zero in on one factor which we see really clearly in the, in the uh, Asbury outpouring, and that is the issue of preparation. One thing that has characterized Asbury both in 1970 when that first uh, simultaneous thing happened with the Jesus movement and now is a lot of repentance. Now, r- repentance means to, it's a, it's a Greek word, metanoia, 
And meta means to change, and noia means you're thinking. Like you've heard of paranoia. It's when, you're, when you kind of are beside yourself in your thinking. Okay, metanoia is when you change your way of thinking, but it also manifests in the way that you're going. In other words, I'm gonna, I've been going that direction, I'm going to shift and go this direction. But it normally is accompanied by what is called a confession and the repentance process. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a way of realigning ourselves with God. It's a place, and I've had to go through many, many seasons in my personal life in Jesus of realigning myself with him. If you go through a hard time and disappointment, that can often cause a little bit of hardness in your heart. You need to realign. If you come through a, a season where you maybe had pretty severe temptation, and maybe you even fell, you need to encounter the blood of Jesus and realign yourself. You guys understand what I'm saying? That there's different things that happen to us in life that can cause us to be knocked off balance in our relationship with the Lord, but we need to be able to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay, now there's a principle or a pattern in Scripture that we see, which is the principle of every time Jesus is about to come, he sends John the Baptist first. That's a pattern. Do you guys know what the word fractal means? Fractal is a pattern that exists in the universe. Okay, so we have a solar system with a sun and a bunch of planets, and we have an atom that has a nucleus with a bunch of electrons. That's a pattern that repeats itself. You guys understand? Like a fern that grows out, and then it's got a bunch of branches going out like this, but every branch has a bunch of branches going out like that. It's a pattern that's a repeating pattern. Well, the pattern of Scripture and the pattern of the history of revival throughout the ages is a pattern of Jesus wants to come, so he sends John the Baptist first. Okay, and that was prophesied actually in Isaiah 40, but we're going to look at the, the quoting of that prophecy in um, Luke chapter 3. So it says here, that now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, verse 1, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip being the tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of uh, Tr Traconitus, Tr Traconitus, and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene. Wow, aren't you glad you don't have to preach and quote all these words? It's like, whoa. Okay, and so anyway, it says, the word of the Lord came to John in the middle of verse 2, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness, and he went into the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Let every valley be filled, let every mountain and hill be brought low, crooked places shall be made straight, rough places be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Prepare the way of the Lord. Okay, now, Diane and I just flo flew into Denver Airport. I don't think that was always the airport. What, where was the airport prior to this? Stapleton. Oh, Stapleton, Okay. But this airport is massive, and it's in the middle of the plains, and it's got these runways that, like, never end. Prepare the way of the Lord. God wants to land in our midst, but he's not going to land on an open field. He's not going to land um, in a lake with, with some of the runners that some airplanes, small airplanes have. He needs, he's a big airplane, and he wants us to prepare the way for the Lord. Okay, so you, you go out there, well, it's rolling hills, but you can't land a plane on a rolling hill. They had to make the runway flat, right? They had to prepare a place for the, the big jets to come in. You know, we, we're in Redding, we were in Redding, California. We just moved out, and Redding had a very tiny airport. I mean, it literally looked like one from a developing nation. Okay, and they had prop planes that would come in initially, and that was how they serviced that. But then they did some massive extensions, and they were able to bring jets in. What a victory. But it took some work. It took some preparation. Prepare the way of the jet. Okay, well, here we are. Prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his paths. Well, who are the preparers? It's the spirit of John the Baptist. Now, Jesus said he came in the spirit of Elijah, that Elijah was also a symbol of that preparation process. Okay, how do we prepare? Well, he gives us a clue here. 
he says, make his, straight, his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain be brought low. Now, we just drove up into the mountains, Estes Park today. It was so beautiful, you guys. But you can see in the road, even though the road's windy, that they had to bring some mountains down to fill the road. And they had to also build up some of the low places because they couldn't have the, the road going like this, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. How do we actually go in and prepare? Well, this is the key to this passage. And it says that we need to fill up the valleys. We need to bring down the mountains. Now, he's talking spiritually. He's talking symbolically. What are the valleys that might hinder God from coming in your life? You know, a lot of us go through stuff, stress at our jobs. We go through problems with our kids, you know. We go through depression ourselves. We pray and we ask God for a breakthrough, and it doesn't happen the way we thought it should. And so we feel disappointed. And those create valleys. They kind of dig out portions of our heart, but those valleys become an obstacle to God coming in because we're not careful to process our pain in the presence of Jesus. You guys understand what I'm saying? In other words, we have been given this relationship so that we can actually process what's going on in our lives. So that ultimately, you know, the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And I know many, many Christians who are living with a low-grade sickness of hopelessness. Because they believed and it didn't happen. And they tried and they failed. And they, they stepped out, but it, they, they hit a brick wall. See, we need the Lord to come and fill up those valleys. To, to raise up those, those low places in our life. But I also know a bunch of Christians, honestly, who are in the mountains, but they're in that place of pride place of entitlement, the place of demand, the place of do it my way, God, or else. And that's the opposite. You know, we can be brought low through the trials of life, or we can be brought high in terms of um, a lack of humility and a lack of processing our re the reality of who we are in Christ. And so some people have that. So what we need to do is we need to, the repentance is a process of filling up the valleys by bringing the high places low. In other words, we're creating a landing strip for God in our personal lives, but then together as a congregation, we're creating a landing place of God for this congregation. We want to invite God's presence and power to come in in greater ways in here. What are the valleys? What are the, what are the disappointments? What are the maybe word curses that we've spoken or the, or the things that, that we've um, just given up on? Or what are the areas where we kind of feel like, well, I deserve this, and I, this belongs to me, and, you know, but we're doing it in the wrong spirit. Pastor didn't preach the message I liked, or that, I hate that worship song, why did that person sing that? The, you know, it's like, where we come in as judges, we come in with pride. The Lord says, no, we need to bring, we need to prepare the way. And then think about the crooked way. Did you ever see a crooked way? runway <laughs> it's like oh i'm landing my plane on a crooked runway no we need to make the runway straight well what is crookedness it's it's places of deception it's places where either the enemy comes to deceive us and that's really his main battle tool of warfare is to lie to us and so we adopt lies and we believe these lies but the lies can hinder god's move in our life because when we come into agreement with lies, we are in disagreement with God. So we need to straighten those things out. We need to straighten the crooked places. And the rough places are just those parts of your personality that nobody can stand. <laughs> and I know we all have them because we have spouses and they point them out to us, right? We need to actually bring the backhoe in. We need, to, we need to plow this ground and create a, a landing strip for God. We need to fill up those broken places. We need to pull down the judgmental places. We need to 
straighten out the deceptive places. And we need to allow the Lord to process through the rough places of our hearts. And the more we do that, the more we allow the presence and power of God to have greater and greater influence in us individually and in us as a congregation. So when we look at when we look at Asbury, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing kids get up and talk about their problem with pornography. We're seeing kids, you know, getting up and talking about same-sex attraction. We're getting people up and just talking about pride and judgment or a lukewarm heart. They're saying, I don't want this anymore. I want Jesus. I want to give my heart fully to him. I want to prepare a place for him to come and land his jet plane inside of me. I want to create that landing strip inside of my heart. Lord Jesus, will you come? Will you speak to me? Will you have your way with me? Even as we sang these songs today. God, have your way. Have your way in me. So let me just skip forward a little bit here because, of course, you know the story. Jesus comes to be baptized. And he says, it's necessary that you baptize me first. And so, but before he comes, actually, I just want to look at this one verse, verse 16. John answered and said to all those he had been coaching at the time, he says, I indeed baptize you with water, but there's one coming who is mightier than I and whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Hallelujah. I mean, come on, you guys. How many of you want a baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire? I want a fresh baptism. The scripture says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, that word filled is in the Greek. It's a continuous word. It says, keep on being feel, filled because we need more. And so was like, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Spurgeon or Moody, but he was asked one time, like, why do we keep needing to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, well, it's because we leak. You know, <laughs> it's like we don't, we don't have the perfect buckets, you guys. We have leaky buckets, and so we need more and more and more of Jesus. And so we need that baptism on a fairly regular basis. Obviously, there's a once and for all reality of when you receive the baptism. But then beyond that, there are infillings. Throughout Scripture, we see this, but it, I know it's in our life as well. Okay, so Jesus gets baptized. And you guys know verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was baptized as well. And he prayed and heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son. In you I'm well pleased. Isn't that beautiful? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one place at that moment declaring to us the triune God, the Trinity in such a beautiful way and then it says the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. In other words, even Jesus had to go through a season of testing, which is so strange, but it's so beautiful and powerful. But then he comes down off the mountain having stood against the lies of the wicked one, having defeated the enemy in his temptations. And then it says that he went into Nazareth and he spoke something. Okay, let me just finish with this scripture. Verse 16 of chapter 4. It says, He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now listen to this. Because this belongs to you. This is the very pronouncement of of the fruit that comes as we realign ourselves with God, as we, as we build that landing strip for the Lord, as we, as we come into right alignment with heaven, as we repent of anything, the valley places and the mountain places and the crooked places, as we turn away from those things and we re, uh, reset ourselves in the Lord. What happened to Jesus, what Jesus declares over himself at this moment, becomes the reality for each one of us. We are little Christs, Christians. We are those who have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus reads. He says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, he has, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the c- recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. What an incredible moment in the life of Jesus. He goes to his hometown and he chooses the very scripture, the most poignant, powerful prophecy of Messiah that was ever given in the Old Testament pointing forward to who Jesus is and was. And he chooses that scripture to declare before the people. In other words... The preparation that John the Baptist brought, the realignment, the adjustment that John the Baptist brought to the people prepared the way for this very moment that we're looking at here. Where Jesus, having defeated the enemy in the wilderness, comes down and then declares, the Spirit of the living God is upon me because he has anointed me. And you know the word anointed is the word that we, from which we draw the, draw, derive the word Messiah. It's the word Mashiach. It's the smearing of oil. It's the anointing of oil. The Spirit of the living God is upon me because He's anointed me. For what? To preach the gospel to the poor. The poor are those that are hungry. They're, they're thirsty. They're longing. You know, uh, Leonard Ravenhill said, When he was in his book, I think, America, You're Too Young to Die, he said the reason in America that we don't have revival is because we're content to live without it. We're happy to just go on with life rather than allowing the desperation, the poverty of spirit to well up within us to such an extent that nothing will satisfy us apart from the full measure of God's Spirit poured out among us. I mean, I I love local church. We're part of a local church, Jesus Culture in Sacramento. We've led local churches for years and years and years. We are in love with the local church. But church can become just a ritual. It can become just something we do. And it has some value even at that level. But honestly... Unless the Holy Spirit is moving in great power, church is just church. It's just a little worship, a Sunday message, go home, you know, shake a hand. But it's not going to change the world unless we come into right alignment with God. But if we do, if we prepare the way of the Lord, if we, if we you know, plow the ground and create that incredible landing strip for God to come, gosh, a hundred people in a room, we can change a city of three million. It doesn't take that many people. There was only 120 on the day of Pentecost, you guys. And they turned the world upside down. This remnant that, that Diane referred to, we can do it here. But look at this. The Spirit of the Lord's upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus, tonight's the night. Join the cause. God is moving. It's time to get on board because you don't want to miss this moment. I know so many people that feel regretful that they missed the Jesus revolution. It just passed them right by. But I feel like blind Bartimaeus. I say, Jesus, don't pass me by. Don't make me wait here. I'm willing to be bold. I'm willing to be loud. I'm willing to be obnoxious because I want more of you and I want to see your purposes come to pass. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He wants us to win the loss, those broken hearts, those sinful lives that have been damaged so deeply that Jesus has a cure. He has a solution for these people that you know. You know them. They're in your workplace. They're people you see in the grocery store. They're people that are walk, you know, living next door to you or across the street. These people are so needy. 
and they don't even know it. Like a, a child in Sudan who, whose stomach is distended from poverty and they become so, so hungry that they don't even know they're hungry anymore. It's time, you guys. It's time not only to preach the gospel to the poor, but it's time to set at liberty to heal brokenhearted people. There's so much brokenheartedness in our culture right now, you guys. Everything's broken. Uh, the political system's broken. The, the economic, the banking system's broken. I mean, go down the list. Hollywood is broken. We need to heal the brokenness of this world. How do we do it? We need more of Jesus. We need more of his presence and more of his power if we ever hope to be the solution that he intends us to be. It's time for us to put aside the other things that might distract us, that might somehow waylay us. It's time to bring ourselves into alignment with his spirit, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to those who are bound and captive. We need to be able to give sight to the blind. You know, the scripture says the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that don't believe. We need to bring light to the blinded eyes. And we need to proclaim the year of God's acceptance. And Jesus closed the book right here, right before the other phrase that says, and the day of vengeance of our God, because God's not bringing vengeance against humanity right now. He's still stretching out his hands saying, come, you guys. There's still mercy. There's still grace. Come, let's build, let's do something together that makes this place the way it was intended to be. God is into this. He just wants us to get into it. So let's prepare the way of the Lord. And so this weekend, I'm hoping that we can actually go there. That each one of us can say, okay, God, I'm going to put my heart in a place of preparation. I'm going to ask you to identify anything within me that might hinder the outflow of your Holy Spirit within me. Can I ask you guys to stand with me? Can we just take a minute before the Lord and just invite the Holy Spirit? And if we could have even a little bit of music just to you know, invite his presence. But I would like us to just take a minute now and say, search me, O God. That's what the psalm says. Search me, Lord. Try my ways. Identify any of the valleys in my heart. You know, as I was praying about today's meeting, I just feel like um, there's a number of us here that have struggled in the last six months with some pretty severe depression. And I feel like God wants to break off depression tonight. He wants to break it off of you so that you can fill up that valley in your heart. I feel like there's some of you who have become cynical and kind of frustrated and angry about what's going on in the world and what's going on in the church and, and the Lord wants to bring that mountain down and just kind of Provide a place for Jesus to come. Some of you have been listening to lies. You've had the enemy telling you you're just a jerk, that you don't matter, that you're not anything, or the enemy lying to you, oh, it's just a little sin, it's not a big deal. Just, just you know, go into it, God understands. There's these little lies that come at us. There's lies that we can have towards one another. God wants to break all those things off so that he can visit us, even this weekend. So we can just invite the Lord for just a minute. Just let him come. And just find one thing that the Lord might want you to lay down before him today. This is really what Asbury was all about. It's about taking the obstacles and laying them on the altar. Putting the, the stuff that hinders you before the Lord. And just saying, okay, God, I want more. But in order to get more, I got to let some things go. I got to let some attitudes go. I got to repent of cynicism or skepticism or criticalness. I've got to repent of, of self condemnation. I've got to repent of, of some of the things I've been allowing my, my eyes to see and the, the temptation to kind of go after. Let's just begin to lay those things down. If you want to come even spend a minute in front of the Lord, just come forward. Right, do you need to interrupt for a second? Do you need to interrupt for a second? Oh, okay.
Yeah, just if you feel like you need, just want to come to the altar, you just lay it down before the Lord. You can do that tonight. You don't have to. But if you're feeling like, no, I want to, I want to step into this. I want to take a, a step forward and say, okay, God, no more games. No more playing. I want you. You can just declare that by coming forward and just saying, okay, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So let's just take a minute. We're just going to sing a song. And then we're going to invite Holy Spirit to do a few other things tonight. To do some healing. To do some blessing. But let's just, let's just, let's just uh, flatten the runway first. Okay? Can we do that together? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. And the scripture says, For this one day I look. I want everybody to realize that. Clean hands and a clean heart. He trembles like it's a God setup that each and every one of you are here tonight. It's not by happenstance. It's not by any of those things. It's just, it's a total, complete, 100% God setup. Thank you, Father. Father, let your grace Thank you, Jesus. When Michael first started, I really felt like God was speaking to me, especially for Eric's church that came to, to be a part tonight. And uh, I really felt like God spoke to me and said that so many times some of you have felt like because of status or because of history or because of a language barrier that you feel like you don't belong and you feel like you can't be a part and you feel like you can only go so far. And I want to let you know that God is saying there are no boundaries in the kingdom. There are no boundaries in the kingdom. There are no statuses in the kingdom. You are a son of or a daughter in the kingdom of God. I really feel that God, not only on, on, there's people all across the room that the enemy just has an orphan spirit upon you. He makes you feel like you can never live up to whatever you're supposed to because of the way you were born or where you were born or the way you've lived or the things you've done. And I want to tell you right now, God wants to break off the orphan spirit and he wants to replace it right now in this moment with a spirit of adoption. He wants to pour out upon you and he wants to show you that you are fully accepted by God. And you know what? If you're accepted by God, nothing else matters. The enemy wants to hold us back from walking into the fullness of what God has for us. I want you to think about Abram. God told Abram to leave his country and go to a place. <laughs> and he didn't even tell him where the place was. I really believe God is calling some of us here to leave the place we're in, and I'm not talking about your physical house, but leave the place we're in, in our mindset, in our spirituality, and in, in where we're at. He wants us to leave that place and move into the fullness of what he has for us. And so, Lord, right now, I just break off that orphan spirit. I just break it off and I cast it to the ground. 
Lord, I just thank you that you bring freedom to the captives. And Lord, that even means our mindsets. That means what we're going through. It means how we think about ourselves. It means how we think about others. And Lord, I just thank you that he who the sun sets free is free indeed in our mind, in our body, in our soul, and in our spirit. I thank you that your word says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that he would find himself just now going to his closet or going to the, the garage to pray. Lord, I pray that you would grant mm. right now in Jesus' name. Fresh, fresh new faith. Yeah. If you felt like you've had that orphan spirit, if you felt like there are things that have held you back, I just want you to come forward and just by just stepping out of your seat, you're saying, you know what? I want to be free from this tonight. I, I don't want to feel like this anymore. Don't worry about what other people around you are saying. If you're being held back by mindsets, if you're being held back by economics, if you're being held back by language, if you're being held back by anything, your past, by your family history. God wants to set you free tonight. Yes. It has nothing to do with anybody touching you. It has nothing to do with anybody praying for you. It's between you and God. Yes. So as we just sing a couple choruses, I just wanna I just wanna welcome you to come up and let God build that runway in you so that you can be that landing strip that Michael was talking about. Jesus, let your power increase on my sister right now. That's it. That's the power of God right now. Just let it increase. Kuramataya toshendo de bokitia. Like the Lord says, this is a time when I'm binding up some broken places right now. I'm bringing some places back. When, it, so when the scripture speaks now, of Jesus name, just receive, setting the captives receive, free. Receive, Jesus demonstrated that over and over in his ministry in a variety of ways, but one of those ways is healing. If you have a need in your body this evening, Jesus wants to set you free from that. It is a captivity. It holds you back. It gets in the way. It affects not only your body, but your mind. And God says, this is your night. We have people here among us 
that have seen the healing power of God manifest in incredible ways. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. of God's on you right now. This power fills you right now. I bless you with peace in the name of Jesus. The shalom of heaven is upon you right now. And I ask, Father, that you would begin to do some rewiring in his, in his mind. That there would just be some reconnections. And I pray the damage has been done. You know that what the Lord does is biological More, Lord, more, Lord Jesus, right now. Just let His power, let Your power increase, Lord. And Father, I pray that You touch.
his heart right now. I just get the picture of like that one. The treasure that he has. And I feel like the Lord is saying there's, there's treasure that's buried here. And God's going to be pulling that, that treasure forth in fresh ways. Not that he has it already, but it's like, I feel like there's a hope for the future. But God's going to be saying, no, I've been waiting for this. For this season. Father, I pray blessing. 